Oh, just so just because, because we have a little bit of right. Okay, welcome to the uh, June 7th meeting of the planning board. Um, I will begin with a roll call. Uh, Paul Clark here. Jeff Royal here. Bob Cove here. Jamie Pennington is not here. Uh, Heather Rogers here. Richard Yeager here. And Rick Tainer here. So we have six of the seven members of the board here. Uh, the first item we have on our agenda is we only have one public hearing tonight. It's the hearing of Richard and Janet Tournament for 8 Avon Avenue for a special permit uh, continued from the May 17th meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Lisa Mead, Mead Town and Costa. Good evening. I'm here this evening with um, my clients, Richard and Janet Foreman, over here, Eileen Graff, the architect on the project, and Ben Taylor, my um, colleague. Um, we're here, as the chair indicated, on a project on um, 8 Avon Avenue, and it's a proposed 6C special permit, which is to create uh, two single family homes on one lot. Um, in order to do so, um, they need a special permit from you. Uh, the property is located, you go to the next slide again, thank you. The property is located in the R2 zoning district. Uh, it's not in the DCOD. The existing single family structure was constructed around 1869. However, it's not listed in the district data sheets, nor is there a form B. So as you'll soon see on the site plan, the property is unique as it relates to frontage on both Alberta and Avon, a small piece on Avon. The primary frontage is along Avon, excuse me, small piece on Alberta, and the larger section on Avon. The primary frontage is on Avon, and then also on Alberta, which ends at a portion of the left side yard, but only extends to a small portion, um, and the majority of it is um, side yard. But it, there is frontage, certainly on Alberta. Accordingly, um, as required to succeed, the property is conforming for a lot area. Um, for a single family at 17,963 square feet, where 10,000 is the minimum required in the single family R2 district. The property has 216.59 feet of frontage where 90 is required. The one existing non-conformity is the front yard setback on the existing structure, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, uh, which is at 13.9, where a minimum of 25 is required. That, of course, is not changing. Both side yard setbacks are conforming. On the right side, it's 15.5, where 10 is required. And on the left side, 76.8, where 10 is required. And the rear is 98, where a minimum of 25 is required. The height of the existing home is 20 feet, 20.9 uh, feet, um, where there is a 35 foot minimum, excuse me, maximum. The property conforms with lot coverage at 8.4%, where the maximum is 25%. Open space at 89%, where the maximum, excuse me, minimum is 35%, uh, and there is ample room for the two existing parking space requirements. The proposed two story addition, if you go to the next slide, for example, uh, we propose to build a by right addition to the rear of the existing single family home and then construct a new single family home on the, lot, on the same lot that conforms to all the dimensional requirements. All of the two family dimensional requirements will also be complied with, and I'll go over those in a minute, except for, of course, the front yard setback on the existing structure, which is pre-existing non-conforming and therefore is in conformance with the requirement. So the proposal is to construct a new one and a half story single family home, kind of a cape design that's conforming as forced to all dimensional requirements. The front yard setback is 45.5 feet um, from um, Avon, where 25 feet is the minimum required. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute in a little more detail. The left side yard setback is 25.5 feet um, from Alberta, um, where 10 feet is required. And the right yard setback from that same, um, excuse me, is 70.8 feet, where the minimum is 10 feet. The rear yard setback is, um, excuse me, the rear yard setback is 70.8 feet, where a minimum of 25 is required. Go to the next slide, Andy. Um, and then the proposed height on the existing structure, which we're going to go through in a minute, is 18.5 feet. Um, and the existing home is 20.9, as I said earlier. So it, in height, it is subservient to the existing home. So from a two-family point of view, it meets all of the two-family 
lot area requirements, setback requirements, lot coverage requirements, frontage requirements, everything that's required on a two-family lot in the R2 district. So here's the site plan, and the um, existing home is on the right bottom of the site plan. You can see the addition in the back is in the darker color line. Um, and then the proposed driveway is um, right attached to the um, existing single family home. Then there's an existing garage that sits on the um, site as well that is um, on the left side. You can see where the driveway goes in. That's an existing garage. And the proposed home is the um, kind of, I'm going to call it the three form structure that is in the back. Um, as you can see, it meets all the setback requirements, and we'll go through the criteria in a minute as soon as Eileen has a chance to review the architectural design. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eileen. You can go to the next slide, Andy, and she's going to discuss with you uh, the architectural design. Um. If we could actually, Andy, do you mind if we go? Yes. So if I could just touch lightly on the architecture, um, the existing building, as you see on this drawing here, is the top left and, and side view on the top right. And um, this existing two-story um, salt box is sort of turned sideways on, on Avon and with one-story structure to the side. So our um, proposal here is a small addition on the rear, taking on a similar um, uh, form as the salt box up in the main form and just extruding it on the back side. Um, the goal here is just to help support a, a relatively small um, um, uh, square footage in, in structure, just to help support some of the main living space, such as the kitchen and the much needed mudroom um, and storage needs. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, we can just wrap around the building. Here you can see that, the, again, that top level shows the existing and the lower level shows the proposed. That rear bottom left view um, shows that really the form is similar in shape and it's just an extension of that same salt box. And then the next slide, please. So here, the second structure on this lot is proposed as a single story, um, the, the intent was really to create one floor living. So with this, we proposed a, a cape like structure um, and, and sort of it made to this one story living we were forced to spread square footage um, on one floor, therefore enlarge the footprint versus having two stories. So here you start to see where the street elevation is small and compact and uh, cape like in form, but then in behind it, uh, we call it little pods um, with more extensions of smaller capes. Um, each sort of um, sort of have their each function, their individual functions in each one, and a little separation to create the privacy that's needed for each one. And then just a little bit of living space on the second floor. We've tried to keep this structure as low to the ground as possible, again, trying to create as minimal steps. Um, into in, in and out of the, of the house. Um, this structure is only 18.5 in building height. And of course, that's the main front building. But as you go further back, you can see it's decreasing in, in, in building height as well as ridge. Um, this is proposed to, to have um, uh, high quality materials. We have uh, cedar clavins on the front elevation and then on the sides. Uh, the proposal of cedar shingles, um, the, the quality uh, double pane um, windows are proposed um, with, with the ability to meet today's stretch code needs as far as energy, um, architectural shingles for the roof, um, and, and a brick chimney right down the center. So sort of trying to sort of give a nod to the traditional um, center chimney uh, cape. Next slide. Actually, sorry, I'll go back to the rendering. Thank you. So here, as we, these renderings will help sort of uh, visualize uh, for you all as you sort of um, progress up the street. So we are on the downhill, from approaching the low street. We're traveling up Avon. And here you can see the existing house. Um, right behind it, again, that addition off the rear, uh, there is a lot of gray change from this uh, point of view. 
So it's really a difficult thing to see um, as you're as you're approaching um, the the existing structure. And as you can see, you just get glimmers of the proposed new structure between the existing garage and the existing house. And the next slide, as you progress, and here's the front elevation, a modest one and a half story in the presence. And then the next slide, as we turn start to turn down Alberta. Um, here you can see the three the three structures in combination. So really trying to uh, work with the texture of the neighborhood and its scale and, and massing. Um, most of the neighborhood has similar caves or uh, ranch-like structures. A lot of them have been expanded, um, both laterally and vertically. Um, you'll see reproduction colonials. You'll see um, duplexes down the hill. So really a variety. In, in types of building form, but this uh, cape-like approach we felt was, was in keeping um, with the neighborhood. And with that, I will pass it back to Lisa, but happy to answer any questions. Go to the my maps, thank you. Andy. So this is um, from the my maps, just to give you an idea of the size of the lot and the relationship to the adjacent structures. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into the criteria of succeed. Um, but you can see on this lot, um, there's a little shed behind the garage that obviously is gonna be removed. Um, and then that area will be the, the new structure, which Eileen just reviewed. Um, next slide, please. And here's a little bit, a larger view. Um, you can see that the, actually the structures that are in the neighborhood are much larger than what's being proposed um, on this um, lot. And, um, there's actually two family structures that are down Avon uh, next to Low Street. And then many of the other structures in the neighborhood are um, single family homes. As you get over on uh, Brissette, there's a, a couple of two families the same way over on Williams, but um, there are single family homes. Over on um, Murphy, um, there are more ranches and capes um, as Eileen described as well. So the next slide, please. So under um, 6C special permit requirements, um, the board needs to make a number of findings related to the criteria in the ordinance. Um, you might recall you all redid the 6C ordinance just about a year and a half or two years ago, I think. So I'm not, I think you've had one or two before you since then, um, but just for um, making sure you can see how it applies in this instance, the lot and building have to comply with the following uh, criteria. Uh, the proposed residential density shall comply with the lot area requirements for two family dwelling in the zoning district. So I said to you um, earlier, here the property has 17,963 square feet, and in the R2 district, it's required to have 15,000. <coughs> Both residential buildings have to comply with the setback, setback requirements of the principal single family building. Here, of course, both of them do, uh, but for the non-conformity that's pre-existing on the existing 1869 structure. So it meets that criteria. And the addition, of course, is a by right addition on the existing structure. Both residential buildings shall comply with all other applicable zoning regulations. Uh, both structures comply, comply with all other zoning regulations and dimensional requirements. The proposed building shall be arranged in the lot um, on, excuse me, on the lot in one of the following manners. Um, so there are three criteria under here. The third one doesn't apply. Uh, the first criteria A is that the two residential buildings shall be located side by side and shall be set back no more than 10 feet further from the street than the average front yard setbacks for existing dwellings on the same block of the street on which they have frontage. That's the first one. The second one is that you have to meet only one of these. If the lot has frontage on two streets, i.e. a corner lot, each residential building may be located fronting on a different street from the existing dwelling, provided that each building has a separate and distinct rear yard conforming to the rear yard requirement of the zoning district. So in our application to you, we indicated that we believe this met the first criteria A. Um, since that time, as recently as this morning, um, the chair indicated to staff that he believed that that was not the case, but that eventually, they believe that um, paragraph B applied. And I believe that frankly, both of them apply. And so 
you can decide whichever you want, but both of them apply or one of the other applies. That's going to be up to you. I'm going to go through how I believe that to be the case. Next slide, please. So on option A, uh, the question is, um, does it meet the average front yard setback? That is front yard, primary front yard from Avon as compared to the other houses on the street. In fact, the ordinance actually says the average front yard setbacks for existing dwellings on the same block of the street for which they have frontage. So those are the other dwellings on the lot, excuse me, on the street, not the dwellings on the lot in question. The average frontage is, so the frontage is on Avon. The block is the side of the street that the house is on. So the ordinance doesn't define block. Under the ordinance, under section 2A, definitions, it says if there's not a definition, you go to the building code. If there's not one in the building code, you go to Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster says a block is um, the uh, usually rectangular space enclosed by streets and occupied by buildings, that is, on one side of the street. So what we did was took the average of the buildings on Avon Street on the same sign, which is what the criteria says. If you do that, the average is 31 and a half feet. So you've got 32 feet setback on four Avon and a 31 foot setback on six Avon. So that's 31 and a half. Then the ordinance allows you to add 10 feet to that. So that's 41 and a half. So we propose a plan that says 45.5. We can do the 41 and a half. I'll show you the 41 and a half in a minute. If you decide that that's the criteria you want to use, I have a plan for you that's at 41 and a half, and I'll give it to you so you can see if it meets all the other criteria. So we believe it meets the first criteria, A. But on the other hand, if you want to use B, it meets that as well. So this is a corner lot. So um, can you go to the next slide, please, Andy? So where's a corner lot for the new structure? You can have it have frontage the 25 feet from the, um, the required frontage from the other street, which is Alberta. Here we have it at 25.5 from Alberta. So it meets that requirement. The next part of that requirement is that both of them have to meet the rear yard requirements as defined in the ordinance and have essentially separate rear yards. So you can see that they're not overlapping or using each other's rear yard. And in this instance, the rear yard for the proposed structure is 70.8 because the ordinance defines rear yard coming from the primary front yard. So opposite the primary front yard, which is Avon Street. So that's 70.8 and the proposed rear setback for the addition on the existing structure is 82.5. So if you go to the next slide, I can go through this a little bit better. So this is the slide that shows 41.5. Just so, so this meets exhibit, this meets the criteria A, we believe, at 41.5, that's the setback. And then you can see the 25.5, if you go to criteria B, from Alberta, we have 25.5, that's actually marked on the plan that you have. 25.5 uh, from Alberta, so it meets that setback. And then it also meets the requirements for the rear yard setbacks for each structure as defined in the ordinance. So you can see um, under the proposed structure, it's uh, 70.8 feet. And under the uh, new uh, existing structure, I think it's 82.5 feet. So it meets, it certainly exceeds the 25 feet. So it meets the requirements for your rear yard setback. So the placement, of the structure on the lot meets the criteria in this section, um, section 2.14 um, of the ordinance. And I'm certainly happy to take questions about that afterwards. The next criteria B, um, you go to the next slide, please, Andy. Oh, I actually, yeah, no, go to the next, the mind maps, this right after that. I just wanted to show you where we got the average of 41.5. You could actually, even if you included the whole block, on that side of the street and you included the house up at the top, which is still on that side of the street, but kind of really on Alberta. Nonetheless, there are the setbacks on the two other houses on Avon, um, on the same block, on the street. That's where we get the average. 
And that's where we got to 41.5. Next slide, please. So the next criteria is that if the um, existing building is listed as contributing in the historic district, uh, we're required to put um, a preservation restriction on it. Uh, there is not a, this is not listed as contributory. Uh, criteria C is before granting the special permit under the section, the board needs to find the design and layout of the building and open spaces in the site will be consistent with the established neighborhood character, scale, massing, and density of the surrounding neighborhood. Here, the proposed addition to the existing structure will be to its rear and be minimally visible from the street, but appropriate for the neighborhood. Um, even with the addition, the existing structure will certainly not be the largest structure in the neighborhood. And the proposed new structure, while it is a more elongated structure, is at the rear of the property and cannot certainly be seen from the street. It will have a minor impact, in fact, on the streetscape, as Eileen indicated. And actually, the structure itself is quite in keeping um, as it street faces um, with the other structures in the neighborhood of being one and a half story cave with the center um, center chimney and it's quite a lot like those on um, in the rest of the neighborhood including those over on um, Murphy. The next criteria, next slide please, is that the buildings and accessory off street parking will maintain a compatible relationship to the adjacent properties in terms of the location and design. And in this instance, the buildings are conforming to all the setback requirements apart from the existing structures, front yard setback. Um, and it's shown that the site, excuse me, site plan, there's an existing tree line around the left and rear and right sides of the property that provides screening um, it with the abutting parcels, <coughs> particularly in and around the left corner where the new proposed structures to be located. Uh, during construction is the um, applicant's intent to take a look at that and um, has had discussions with the north, uh, the neighbor uh, north on Alberta that one back in the corner, um, whether additional screening should be planted beneath the existing large pines. And if you could just slide up Andy to the, um, maybe to one of the mind maps I can point it out. Yeah, that's good. So if you see on the top where the um, back, that house that's kind of doesn't really have any frontage in the corner, so there is a line of very tall pine trees between these two properties right there. And so the question is, um, if during construction, any of that underbrush is cut out, if they need to have more vegetation put in there, um, the applicant is certainly um, willing to do that. Um, the uh, parking for both structures uh, will be provided in the off, in off street parking in both driveways, which are appropriate um, for each of the structures. It will not affect the privacy of the adjacent properties, either as one of the driveways is the existing driveway near the front corner of the property. And the new driveway is the very center of the front yard away from the nearest abutting properties. Uh, we've been in contact with um, Wayne Amaral um, about a curb cut, as you saw in your staff notes. Uh, he didn't see any problem with granting a, a new curb cut there, um, obviously saying we would have to start the process after um, the application were approved if the board is so inclined. Um, the next criteria is that developing a sec second residential building in the lot will be equally or more beneficial to the neighborhood than subdividing the lot or providing two dwelling units and a two family dwelling. Um, so, um, the, there's, it's not feasible to subdivide the lot. Uh, there's not enough space to create two new lots without additional zoning relief, including variances. So that's not an option. Um, and then concerning, you could of course um, provide a two family out of the existing structure. However, even though it's not listed as historically significant or um, on the historic data sheets, it was constructed around 1869 and adding a whole second unit on it um, would take away from that existing salt box um, structure. So even though you could do it from a dimensional point of view, it's probably not really the best thing to do with that existing historic structure. And instead, keeping both structures of similar size as compared to the rest of the neighborhood. If you, I don't know if any of you have driven by, but as you go up Avon Street, you can see the, the houses at the bottom that are two families are significant in size. And so the idea was that as you move into the neighborhood at the top, you, you transition into those two single family homes that were more consistent with the homes on, on Avon and back on the back of Murphy. So we believe that it serves the neighborhood much better um, in massing and size 
um, to do the two single family homes rather than the two family, even though frankly, a two family could be done uh, with, a, uh, with a, a use special permit from the zoning board of appeals. The next criteria is that uh, in granting the special permit, the two family, re two residential buildings a lot, the planning board can impose uh, other setback requirements, more restrictive requirements, um, and require that the special permits granted under the section that no further subdivision be permitted. So I'm sure you're all aware that there are some older special 6C special permits that people have purchased over time and they would prefer to have them as two separate ANR lots. Um, this has now taken care of that so that you can't subdivide it and that, um, that is fine. Uh, the next criteria is that there will be a donation of $20 per square foot for the additional second residential building into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And of course, the applicant is aware of that criteria and of course would comply with it um, as well. Uh, there um, are no, um, we're going to go up the street so you can see the pictures. And as we go up, you can see there's no, there's no sidewalks. Here. So we don't, compliance with the street tree sidewalk ordinance, uh, the director said we don't put the sidewalk in because there are no sidewalks. Um, but as you go up Avon, so this is traveling up Avon, you can see the size of these buildings. Here's a sample of this, this one of the salt boxes that exists on the street. Um, keep going, thank you. Um, and so we're getting, uh, this is the house right next door on the right-hand side, and keep going up one more. And um, so you can see the house at the top of the street there on the right-hand side. And next slide. And so here's a view of the, of the house right now. This is kind of where that rendering was done from. Um, I think Rob might have taken the telephone pole out of the rendering. It looks much better without the telephone pole. Um, but you can also see that there are no sidewalks here. Uh, the director did indicate that um, it'd be great if the applicant planted a tree in the front yard, but the property line goes right up to the street. So uh, it, would be, it would be on private property. We're not inclined to agree to something that was similar to what was on Hancock Street because that caused a lot of consternation for the city council. So um, that's the, the photo in the front, and I think there might be one more. And here is a photo looking into the site. Um, that's the, um, the garage with the shed in the rear. Um, the next slide, please. And then this is looking down to the end of Alberta with that um, house in the way back there, which shares the property line with the larger pine trees. And you can see the large stand of pine trees uh, there. So most of these are on, if not all of them are actually on the other property, not on the Hornman's property. Um, so with that, um, also I would like to say you should have in your file uh, four letters of support. Um, you have one from Seven Alberta, who is across the street, directly across the street. Uh, five Murphy and three Murphy. Those are two properties that are in the rear yard. Um, so they directly abut the rear yard. And then six Avon, which is um, an abutter as well. A direct abutter, um, just directly down. So there, that's the other direct abutter. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the board or however, whatever process you'd like to use, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the architect. Good. Right. Yeah. And it, would, it relates to the budget this will go back. Um, yes, to this image. So uh, this image, and I, I don't recall from earlier in the presentation what the building heights were, but this image seems to show the new building, the peak, the peak of the new building being more at the Soften of the existing building. Is that is that accurate, or is this I mean, is that just how does that relate to this perspective and so forth? Is that, we're talking about the same thing. Sure, that's a good question because um, let me double check. Only by building height, yeah, it's right, twenty nine of the existing. It's 20, 20. point nine for the existing. But if your question is in fact about bridge, is that what you were asking? I was. About? I was wondering. It, it appears, I mean, just it's just the way I look at this image. It appears to me that the ridge of the new building is at the soffit of the, uh, the eve of the existing building, and I just don't know if that's true or not. Right, and it and it is a hard thing because it's all perspective, right? Yeah, right. 
and then building height is relative to the grade at that house, at that footprint. Location. Yeah, I was just wondering so about that. Given yeah. that, yeah. I'll give you some numbers because we have the, the, the city likes to have the reference point of the ridge line, so I can reference that. So the existing ridge line, ballpark, 23.4. Okay, so the blue house right there, 23.4. Again, grade changes per per location. So now for we move over to the new structure. Um, the ridge height is 23.2 on the front building, on the cape piece. So the buildings are approximately the same height? 23.4 on the original and 23.2 to the ridge of the So they really are the same, they're the same height? More yep. or less to the ridge if you define it, if that's the number. But, but that's not how the city measures height, right? I'm, so just wonder, I'm just wondering in terms, not in terms of how the city measures height, in terms of how it's going to appear on the street. So they, they basically are essentially the same height because I thought that the new building was lower than the existing building, but it really isn't. It's lower in, build, in terms of building definition for building height, so yes. Right. So if you argue, I guess I I'm would, not <laughs> I, if we argue as far as not not sort of appearance, because you're asking about a line that a map that exists um, in reality, um, the the blue the blue house in this rendering sits much closer to the street. So our experience as a pedestrian and someone in the neighborhood, etc., we're going to feel the presence of the two story salt box and that ridge due to that perspective of being so much closer. Now, if we then travel down the street to that view that Andy just had, and we experience the cape, granted the ridge might be in space, the same line vertically, but the reality is we're experiencing one story of wall, of that clabbered facade, and that pitch of that roof is shooting way back. And we're going deep, deeper in, Again, for what we, for, if we decide to do 41.5, you know, versus the, is it 13 for the existing? Right. It's a big difference in how you experience it. So while we could discuss the sort of line being the same, the experience in reality and, and perspective will be a different. Be no, a different I, just, I just want to know mathematically sure. what the one was calling the other. Um, are there other questions for board members? Good evening. So I was curious with the garage to the uh, structure that now is the new structure, that would imply that there was a historic structure there before. Is that fair to say that was removed at some point since that's an existing garage? Um, we don't. Mine's more of a curiosity as to what, if what, what. So you think there what, might have been another structure given the relationship of the garage to the house? Uh -huh. uh, we don't have any evidence of that. No, but, yeah. Okay. I'd like to say, yeah, there was. So we're just going to replace it. <laughs> I, I <can't. laughs> Had I found that, you can be sure that I would have said that. <laughs> no, I, I, we, we have no evidence of that. And you did mention there's no form B for the. There is no form B for the house. And it's not on the district data sheets. The other question? Okay, in that case, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody who's on the room online who would like to speak? Yes, come, come ahead to the podium and please give your name and address. Um, comments. Hello, my name is Jim Kilroy, and I'm the abutter at 681 which is just to the right of uh, Bridget's house. Um, I, as indicated, I had already signed a paper in support of Richard's project, which I, I thought the idea of two separate structures would be better for the neighborhood than an attached structure, which he apparently is already entitled to. If he wants to do that now. Um, my only question came up today after seeing the artist's rendering of the street view with, with the fire hydrant and without the telephone pole. Um, actually, right where that is today, there is a two level retain, retaining wall between uh, that property and my property. 
And I just would like assurances that that retaining wall won't be disturbed as part of this project. Yeah, I don't yeah, see no any reason. No, no construction is going to really occur. Okay, right the, way, the way it was drawn, they had the, the yards sloping to the right. To, it would actually would overlap with the existing. That's, yeah. You want to go back to the photograph and so we can see what the existing condition is. Mm -hmm. so that, that, the way that's drawn, it's, it's going like yeah, it took away eight the, feet past the retaining yeah. wall. The retaining wall pretty much lines up with that fire hydrant, or maybe a foot or two off of it. You can there see right there, you can see the fire hydrant, you can see the, the telephone pole. And the, the retaining wall is there, it's, it's actually two tiers. Uh, you can see those bushes growing on it, that's on the tier between the two. And my understanding is the property line runs right down the middle of that terrace. So yeah. Whether those bushes are on my property or yours, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Wait, um, there's no, there's no work. There's no, yeah. All right, just from the drawer, it looked like it was coming much further to the right. I just wanted to make sure the board had understood it. So those are good. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Excuse me. Yeah. There, there's no work. This is Rob's rendering. There, there's no work proposed on that side of the house, except for the addition in the back. So there's nothing that's going to happen to the retaining yeah. wall there. And we're happy to have you have a condition in there just to satisfy you to make sure that, that there's no work proposed there. Yes. Again, please say your name now. My name is um, my name is Tina Ross, and I live across the street from um, the Bordermans. And I do have issues because although it's not a historic house per se, this area is one of the oldest. Um, it used to be a hunting ground in Newburyport. The trees are incredible. There is a lot of fir trees that have um, they're huge, and they took in their renderings. They're taking one down to put an asphalt parking. And that really bothers me because a lot of trees have already come down and that's the feeling of the place is in those trees. They're, they're, you can see in one of the pictures that she has of the house as it exists now, you can see the tree, see how huge it is. And then you can see um, there is no tree. That one. See on the far left? I know there's trees along the other, along Alberta. I mean, basically they're gonna take that tree down to, I think, to have the park. Right, so that's a big issue for me because I look out at that tree and that's one of the areas, one of the things that's really, really special and historic about this uh, area. Um, someone called, the woman who used to own the street on Alberta and her daughter, I think is on Zoom, um, said it was called Worcester Heights when we moved in there and told us about it and about um, how people hunted there back in the 1600s. You know, it was, it's one of the tallest um, places in Newburyport. And it has a very unique character because of um, the old trees. So that is something I wanted bring up for you guys. Um, I don't care personally as much about the house. The house has gone through a lot of restoration, uh, renovations. The people who owned it prior to them made other renovations. Uh, it doesn't, it's a new color. You know, there's things that have changed to it. And yeah, it's a salt, salt box house, but to me, the history is in the grounds and the way those trees are. So that that is a question for me. And also thing, I hate the parking and I don't know um, what you're asking the variance for because Lisa said we met this criteria, that criteria, and that criteria. So I'm trying to understand this 6C ordinance, was it developed for people who couldn't afford to stay in Newburyport so they could have their family like build on an existing lot, even though there wasn't enough space, or what? What is the what is the variance now for? If she says there's enough this and there's enough that, I want them to understand. So, so there's no variance being requested. It's a it's a special permit that we have in the ordinance. It's been in the ordinance for a number of years, um, which uh, where where a where a two family house is allowed, 
it provides a process for allowing two single families instead of one two family. So the, the, this, uh, as Attorney Mead said, this property could be essentially almost by right. It, it could be converted, it could be expanded into a two family. Without going through this, but yeah, because but they want to build a second house on it, they don't have enough land. They have enough land. Okay. They have enough land, they have enough frontage. It's it's the um, the only issue is having two dwellings on a single lot. That's something that's ordinarily not allowed, but this provision allows that to happen in the cases where a two family could otherwise be developed. Otherwise be what? Could otherwise be developed. So they could they could um, put a two family home on this lot. Okay. Uh, whether by removing a home and putting a new two family or by expanding the existing home into a two family. This provision, which is somewhat unique to Newbury Court, um, I haven't seen it in other places, allows uh, the owner to apply for permission to instead of doing the two family, to do two single families. And the idea is that I think, as, as Attorney Mead said, the, there's potentially less massive if you have two smaller single families. Less what? It's less, it could be less massive. If you have two single families rather than one larger two family, that's massive. Yeah. Well, that's that's the that's the theory. Okay. All right. So that's what I thought. Um, basically, I'm. Um, thank you for this. Um, I was still calling for public comment. Oh, I was just going to address the tree issue oh, real, real sure. quick. Um, <laughs> so. Um, that fir tree, um, when Wayne was out there, he, you know, he was looking at it also. Um, he's frankly happy that it's coming down because he's worried about the power lines. We would also likely take it down anyway because it's going towards the house. I think that was the issue that Wayne wanted to have another tree planted. Our clients are happy to have another tree planted in the front yard. Um, no problem at all if you want to make that a uh, condition of the um, permit. But the, the tree has to come down for a bunch of reasons given its size and location. Can I, I just ask, um, looking at the plan, the plan is kind of confusing because some of it is an existing conditions plan and some of it is a proposed plan. So there is a circle to the left of the proposed driveway. And there's also a kind of an oblong that overlaps that circle with an exit. Can you tell me where that tree is in relation to that proposed driveway? I can't yeah. see it. I think, I think that's it. I don't know what the X is. I think it's the X. It's the X. It's the X. It's the X. It is it? Is it the X? Yes. So what is the, so what is this thing? What is the, the, uh, the, the bushier, bushier uh, structure, uh, tree, tree, shrub, um, but it's the one that has the bushier trees that are right next to the crosshairs there. That's the pond. So, so um, I'm sorry. So the, there are two kind of clouds that are they both existing or proposed? I, the oblong, oh, existing. I think that oblong shape is signifying the sort of mulching yeah. area. It's mulch. Yeah. Yep. It's the mulching area. Mulch bed. Yeah. So all of that is existing. Yeah. Yes. None of that is proposed at this point. No. And if I could just throw this out. You, you, you need to see that. Oh, sorry. Okay. And state your name, which is Richard Barnum, uh, 881. Um, that pine tree. Um, as I've just become aware, because we're having another tree removed on the lot, we met with the tree guy to do that. That pine tree is leaning towards our house. And so that is worrying me. And just today I, I talked to, I emailed the guy and I said, I'd like you to take a look at this tree because I'm worried that in a windstorm, it might come into our house. So just throwing that out, I do have some concerns because of the leaning of that big tree. Thank you. So yeah. do we have do we have I know that there was a plan that showed the proposed tree location. Do we yes. have that? Um, no, we didn't. There were this here. Yeah. That's it. Okay. What is Who's that? That's that? Wayne's plan. Oh, okay. I was like, we didn't submit that plan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, on, it's in the record. It's on the, Who's handy work is that? So, okay. yeah, I mean. I'll just ask for more public comment. Is there anybody else in the room who has a uh, comment on the application? Is there anybody online who has? 
Megan Valley. Megan Valley. Go ahead. Hi, this is uh, hi, this is Megan Rowley from to Alberta. Um, I think um, that can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I feel as though the addition and the structure will fit in nicely with the neighborhood. Um, we just want to reiterate that the natural buffer between the two properties is our main concern at this point. Is, is two Alberta the, the property at the end of Alberta? Yes. Yes. Thank you, boys. I don't see anybody else raising a hand. Uh, and nobody else in the room. Okay, then I'll close the public comment and uh, begin deliberations. Right forward. And I would just like to say, you know, I, um, since Attorney Meade made the reference, um, I disagree with your interpretation about from how you can.
just to, to point out, as I have before, that you know, in previous versions of the amendment, when, when we were talking about units like the second unit on the same piece of property, all of those previous proposed amendments required that the owner be present when the yes, garden was ready. So I think you know this if this language says 120 days related to owner occupied, which I have absolutely no problem with. I would like this to remain consistent with previous proposals where when, when we talk about um, properties where there is that second unit on the same property, that, that because the owner could be present, they should be present. That's part, part of the problem in, in simplifying the, the, the types of units in, in previous proposals is that this kind of gray area develops around that particular unit. I, uh, I think we just need to make it clear. Well, I, I would prefer to see it that, that in that case, the owner is required to be present. So what you would be, the, the edit that you would be looking for, I think, is, so, so right now I have it as, however, if owner-occupied SGRU includes a second unit of the lot, the absence allowance should be reduced for example, the 60 or 90 days from the other the other. What would satisfy you would be, however, if owner occupied this chair, you include the second year in the lot, the absence of alignment should be limited to the other. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know that everybody agrees with that, but that's, you know, yeah. I, I try to capture, yeah, I try to capture both instances, but that's a good good point to discuss. I mean, what, how do people feel about that situation when the owner occupied unit? Uh, the owner occupied STRU essentially includes second structure or a second unit of the structure as the same structure as the owner's principal primary residence. Do you think that in that situation, the owner should be present all the time, as, as Bobby said, or do you think that there is an option for some absence requirement? That's just the only thing. Just, just to say one more thing about it. And for me, um, all of this needs to be looked at through through the filter of you know the goals for this amendment, which is you know minimum impact on the neighborhoods, at least in part. So my point of view is where wherever there's an opportunity to address that by the owner being present, by the owner taking responsibility for the rental. Uh, in real time, I, I think we should reinforce that. Comments? This is an yeah. important point. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Again, just, that's, just one, sorry, just yeah. one last thing. That's, that was all talked about in, in you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, in other various amendments, and, and there was general agreement around it. So I just don't see any reason to, to change. I, I agree with that point, but I do think if you have a separate separate building on the lot that's offered as an STRU, I do think that's more akin to the uh, investor. Oh, and so in a sense, I think those requirements should be should be more similar. Which which if you're requiring the the one to be present, that's not similar to the investor, investor owned unit. Except that investor yield unit is not allowed in the yeah, residential yeah. districts in this yeah. proposal. So yeah. I think that's that's you know, that's where we're kind of over bleeding from one kind of yeah. thing another. And there's there's really kind of two paths that, that are being defined here. And these, these first two bullet points to me are kind of linked. Um, because you you could say that owner occupied only refers to units that, that the, the owner lives in as their primary residence. And it does not apply to, for example, a two or three family house where the owner does occupy one of those units and the rent for the third. Uh, what's being suggested by the first bullet point is that in that instance, that's more like an investor unit because the owner doesn't live in the unit that is being rented. And, and as Rick just said, you know, 
part of what's being proposed here is the the investor unit is is limited by by where it can can that's allowed to be allowed in the city. So if if that were not the case, and and if that type of unit were were lumped into the owner occupied category, then then I think there needs to be the language that talks about. 120 days for an owner occupied unit, uh, and then eliminating that altogether with the requirement that the owner be present uh, if, if they're renting out the second unit in a two family house or the second unit in the same property. So it, it's kind of one or the other, and I think both of these bullet points. Everybody's crowding. <laughs> so let me just ask, let me ask it this way. Does anybody strongly disagree with Ron's point? Or if we were to, if this, if this were to be changed to essentially say that the um, that the owner occupied, we have to almost go back to the wording from two years ago to, to, in order to make this work, but um, to say that the absence allowance only applies to the case of the owner's Primary residence. residence. And if there are two units on the lot, the owner has to be present when the second unit is being used as a short term. Is there, is, there a, is there a concern about changing the wording like that? Because that's that's a big hurdle to get over. If we do that, then we're getting out here. Yes, how do you So essentially, <laughs> an owner occupied, and let's call it like front house and make it the back house or something. Yep. In order for them to go away on vacation, they can't rent the back at all or the secondary unit at all, what we're saying, because we're saying it's a short term rental. It's a short term rental. And then if they want to rent their primary residence for up to 120 days, they also have to give up the income on the back. So they have to flip flop the income potential. Because you're saying you have to shut down the second unit if you're going to exercise this up to 120 days on the primary residence. Right. Essentially, you'd only be able to have one short term rental unit on your lot at a time. At any given time. time. Yeah. Is, it, is it at any that. given time or is it ever? It says there's only one lot. Well, I think, I think the way this works is that if you had two units on your property, you lived in one. While you're living in your unit, you can rent out the second unit as a short term rental. But if you want to take off for the for the winter, go to Florida, you can rent out your primary unit, but you can't rent out the second. Okay, unit. can I just be devil's advocate? Yeah. What's the difference? If you're not there, who cares which unit these people are in? <laughs> Yeah, so you have two, you own, you own a two family, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And you live in this one and you short term rent this one. And you say, I want to leave town for 120 days. Now the ordinance is going to say, well, now people have to move into my house. They can't just keep using the one because there's still no eyes and ears. There's still nobody watching the property. But why am I now bringing them into my personal space? Why can't they just be in the unit I've been renting all along? I think the point before in the in the previous versions was I think there was language in there that said that the owner or an appointed representative or I think the, the word operator was used and, and rather rather than the scenario that, that you have suggested I think the scenario is if you want to leave and go on vacation you can rent your unit but but the appointed operator has to be present to oversee the rent. but i don't think that's what that says that's not what that says but that's what previous amendment proposal so i just i keep referring back to that because it was it was a, a very important part of some of the previous proposals and and i i feel like you know, in combining the, the description of unit type, we've kind of lost that, that definition. And also in those previous proposals, it was the owner or an appointed approved operator. So you could, you had the flexibility to leave and do whatever you wanted to, but it, there was still 
a requirement that somebody be responsible. And that's okay. That's fine. But if, if, as my primary residence, that I don't operate as an STRU year round, if I exercise that 120 days, there is nobody that's going to be there. That's, that's true of all the other jobs, right? If, if, if I'm gone. If you're gone. There's no, there's the no point. The reality of this person. right now is that with investor units and owner occupied units, nobody's home. You know, you're, you're renting it and, and nobody is there to see the rent. It, it's only in. Which is why I think that it's a parallel to if you have two units and you leave for 120 days, it's the same scenario that there's nobody there and you can continue to rent that designated short term rental unit and, and lock your house up. Right. Now, so, back to what was previously proposed. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but if there's an opportunity for an owner or an owner's representative to be present and be responsible, back to protecting neighborhoods again, I think we should do that. And I just have to say one more time. I understand family, there isn't that occurrence. So I don't know how you can do it for one instance and not the other. You're only going to be allowed to have one short term rental anyway, or one per, per owner. Right. Correct. So, just, I mean, that's a good question. But <laughs> why, if the, owner can, if the owner can be absent and rent out their primary residence for 120 days, what's the difference with that versus? Running out a second year lot and locking up the house for 120 days. Is there, is, there, is there a difference? I think there's a, a difference in perception, but I don't personally think there's a difference in the execution of the whole exercise there. So, oh, say also, with the license specify one or the other, it's not the license isn't going to cover both. Right. Right. I, I, my, thinking and reading the proposal was that you would only get one license and you would not have a license for if you go away and you want to rent your and the other license and you could use whichever one you wanted at a time. Um, I don't think that there is a major difference between if somebody has a second unit and goes away. I think that in the licensing, I would assume, and I think, I think we've talked about this in the past, but somebody, you know, there should be a requirement, and maybe this is a problem that we haven't done the licensing, or that there isn't a proposal, um, but that there's someone available 24 hours a day. Um, and I would have that for all the different categories. Um, if you're not there, somebody has to be there, a representative that can deal with any issues. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I see Bob's point that they can be there, so maybe they should, but I, I certainly wouldn't say they have to be there every single time. I would, you know, as a compromise, I would say maybe 60 days, you know, if they have a vacation planned and someone wants to rent their unit, they can go ahead and do that on occasion. They're still there when they can be most of the time. So, I so are you suggesting that it could be two, two short term rentals in the lot at the same time? No. Oh, no. Okay. no. I, I think <clears throat> just, just to go back to a year ago, again, there were, there were four different types of units that we talked about. Um, and, and there were two of those units one was a home share, and one was an owner adjacent where where the owner was required to be present, just to explore a little bit of history on, on all of that. I, I think all, all of this gets resolved if you if you include um, that unit type where there's more than one unit on a single property. If you include that with investor units, then I, then I think it's all resolved because investor units. Um, have a definition and, and a, a special permit process. And that to me kind of resolves the, the sensitivity issue about neighborhood. 
but I wouldn't feel as strongly about the, the owner being present. So I think, and now all of that is kind of raised in the first bullet point. So I think if we were to suggest that, that owner occupied units only refer to units that, that are the operator's primary residence and everything else is categorized as an investor unit, then, then I feel much better about, about all of this and its impact on the business. So then you would be prohibiting the owner of duplex from renting out the second unit in the duplex in the residential districts because investor units are allowed. Is that, is that your intent? That's, that's what the current proposal says. Well, it's a special permit. It, it's not special permit in R3. No, but R1 yeah. and R2. R1 and R2 is not permitted. Yeah, so you would be, in the South End, you would be prohibiting uh, the unit, the duplex, from being rented out. That's, that's, where, that's where that would be. And that's really what bullet point number one says. Yeah, I struggle with because I don't see that as an investor unit because the property owner is actually there. I see the investor unit, to me, is more of an absentee owner as opposed to one is there primarily. I struggle with that idea. I'm trying to avoid <laughs> I'm trying to avoid doing what we did last time, which is saying you do people like this, two people like this. It was really very difficult. So I, I, I'm trying to get to a point where we can say this is a possibility and this is a possibility. Um, without without being so directive to the council. Um, let's pass on this. <laughs> Come back to it later. <laughs> just, just one thought on that. I mean, I, I, if we categorize them that way, but don't say, don't call it an investor unit such that they're not excluded from the R2. But say that conditions would apply to it. I don't know if we could work it that way, but to me that makes more sense. We can move on. <laughs> yeah. just one, one, one last thing. And again, this, this is about protecting the neighborhoods. And, and to me, you either protect the neighborhoods by, by limiting the uses that are allowed in certain neighborhoods. Which, which is the, you know, the, either the special permit process or, or you know, categorizing it as not permitted. You, know, you either do it that way or, or in, in describing how they operate, you, you make sure that you, you've given every opportunity for the operator to be responsible to the neighbor. It's, it's one or the other. And you know, if, if we allow those units in the more sensitive residential neighborhood, then I think there's no reason why we can't put the requirement on those operators to be responsible to the neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you possibly in here or somewhere out in this, uh, not necessarily getting a specific markup, right? Because it's clearly there's difficult to get into, you know, something that people sort of agree on in terms of specific language, but perhaps just to, to on the point that you're putting emphasis on the fact that there's, there remains concern, uh, regardless of what terms we use or which category we're talking about, about the extent to which, um, you know, an owner, you know, the, the operator of the SRU can be away or not have somebody on the premises. Um, that varies obviously in different degrees for individual members or you know in different types or what we can call them. Um, but at the end of the day, the underlying concern there, I guess, is, is whether or not there's someone who's actually physically present to address concerns um, that you know may be problematic for the neighborhood, you know, while they're away, essentially. I don't I don't know here in the context if it's possible to get to a specific that you know to the point. And it might be necessary to put the emphasis of you know the, the characterizing issue, even if you can't get to a specific where enough members can agree on a specific time, you know, to put in here to get to that get one hundred forty. But to, at least so that the council hears what the you know, underlying concern. And yeah, I think, and I think the underlying to me the underlying concern here is that um, 
you lost something by combining everything into into a single category, right? And that so right, we recommend that we go back to the previous. I mean, we can't. We have to respond to this particular ordinance, but we can. But we can say that we prefer the previous approach, which is to look at without saying how we would do it. But we, we would think that a second unit on the same lot as the owner's primary resident should somehow be treated differently than the owner's primary resident. If we said something like that, then be treated differently, meaning it has more scrutiny somehow, whether it's a special permit process or something, without offering something specific that requires more scrutiny. Is that? Yeah, I think that somewhat covers it, but I, I was just thinking um, if we have a, if we say something to the effect of uh, there must be an operator present if the owner is absent. And that gets into license. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, because that's, that's, that's really our concern, I think, is, to, is uh, having someone that's responsive to the neighborhood. We can't, we can't, we can't address operations. If I may, yeah. uh, I, I can't you know, presuppose what the council's going to do here, but I think in every discussion that I've been involved with today, I think there's a presumption that that provision would be in there for someone to be responsive as a as a party. Um, to my understanding, I think the issue that Bob is getting or the question is, is, does that mean that someone's on the premises or is it effectively someone you're calling but you're not sure if they're anywhere near to, you know, right. that, I, that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I sent language around a few weeks ago from one of the previous post that, that addressed all of this and you know I it, it fundamentally said you know does the owner must be present during during all rentals so, you know I, if if there's a way of getting back to that somehow for uh, that particular situation that we're talking about I think I think that would be helpful it, you know, I think fundamentally in combining the, the four different rental types that, that we had and trying to simplify it, and I applaud the efforts to simplify it. Uh, I think we've lost, you know, that that gray area in between. If we look at potentially a property that has two structures or is a two-family, and if we look at a single family, which I feel like is what this 120 days is more. When I read it, I interpreted it more to be like for somebody who doesn't do STR use throughout the year, but might go away for an extended period, it's an opportunity for them to get a license for this particular thing. If this home, which is a single family home, goes vacant for up to 120 days, I don't see the difference between that person leaving an STRU behind because they're both unoccupied, unmonitored. However, if the language was put in that said something like upon that 120 days maximum, a notification to a butter is will be given of the contact person within the zip code, like really keep it as tight as you can, so that all of the butters feel comfortable that somebody is within 10 minutes, because that's what our radius pretty much is, that that might make them feel comfortable. Because I keep going to that single family, the way it's written, a single family is somebody's neighbor, that just can be like woof for 120 days. I think it would be more comforting, but that other property should be like able to operate similarly to me. And I you know I think that it just keeps coming back to the license and enforcement. That's kind of the last bullet that we have is that you know, all of these things we're talking about, making sure an agent is on the property or or is readily available, that kind of thing, all relates to licensing provisions rather than use regulation. So um, I mean, as I said before, let's skip over this. <laughs> and go to page two. We'll come back. <laughs> um, so we had the, the, the first bullet on page two was about number of bedrooms and occupants. And um, we're suggesting that the ambiguity in terms of how you determine the required number of parking spaces 
could be resolved by tying a number of occupants to a number of bedrooms, for example, two adult occupants per bedroom. Were there were any concerns about that? Just stop me when something comes up. Um, so, neighbor, yeah, just yes, okay, stop. I, 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 no, I, I don't have any problem with it. Okay. Um, and defining both occupants and, and bedrooms. When, when I look at the proposed amendment, um, when they talk about park, um, it says, for example, two or three bedrooms offered equals one added space required. Um, I don't have any problem with the numbers here necessarily. I, I just, you and I have talked about this before, and it's it's the, the kind of ambiguity around what is required by zoning and what exists commonly in, in the neighborhoods, which is existing non-conforming conditions. So I, I would love for there to be some language that is a little bit more specific than, than one added space required, because it doesn't really define what the baseline is. Right. So I don't have any problem with, with the numbers or, or the bullet point that you've written, but I think ultimately when we get to helping the review process related to whether a property complies or not, I think we have to be very specific about what the baseline is for, for these properties. I'll put that in as a I, I did mention that to the sponsor before, but you didn't get it right. Um, so the next one is uh, neighborhood input. Some planning board members strongly believe that the formal process for notice to and input from butters and other neighbors should be required for all STRDs in residential neighborhoods. As a consequence, these members oppose allowing any STRDs as of right in these neighborhoods, which would be requiring a special permit for STRDs. I know that's not shared by everybody, but just, just stated it that way. Go ahead. I'm not a fan of this based on the length of time that this ordinance has dragged and the level of emotion it has created in the city. I feel as though there are neighborhoods that could have well operating properties that would comply with all of these rules, and yet. There's neighbors who just don't want this in their backyard. And I think that that's an unfair sort of tilting of the scales. If a neighborhood is, in, if a um, home is in full compliance, that that motion has become so raised that the facts are then sort of pushed to the side. So I feel like if that three strikes you out, sort of policy, what is within the license, like if there's complaints and there's issues that the license gets shut down, that the neighbors should just go through the motions because an owner of one that may have had issues may behave better. If it doesn't, it's going to go away. Um, and sometimes from what I've heard from the public comments, I don't find them to be actual issues. I feel them to be just more like an emotional, I just don't want this, but it's something that we have to have in the city in order for the city to continue to grow and prosper downtown. So I just think that it, it just opens the door for more to be shut down than should be. So, so I understand your, your point. And I guess what I was trying to say is that some members, not everybody, some members feel this way. Um, and you know, if nobody feels that way, um, I'm happy to take this bullet out. And I, I, I feel that neighbors need to have, need to be allowed into, into this process. I wish that that didn't mean a special permit process. I wish that it could happen as part of licensing or something uh, that was a little more streamlined, but I think it's unfair. I, I understand what you're saying. But the flip side of that is it's it's unfair to 
drop this into the middle of the neighborhood without any limitation on the number of units that could exist in a, in a neighborhood, uh, without any defined licensing or enforcement process, and, and say to residents, you can rely on the three strikes and, and your route process. Number one, that puts the onus on the residents to be the police when they just want to live in their house and, and have a reasonable neighborhood. And number two, there's, there's no enforcement process that really backs any of that up. So, so I hear what you're saying, but but I, I don't see any of that in place right now. And that, that gets to some of the later bullet points, but I, I still think um, you know, it's important to recognize they were and, and you, know, you can theoretically, leave from my theoretically uh, there's no reason why the licensing commission could pull its own public hearing. They just don't. Right? So. Well, I think, uh, it, well, that, that is true. I think we could have a requirement to hold that. I guess the question here is, I think, largely comes down to licensing typically is something to meet the criteria check boxes. Whereas with the zoning, I think the, the special permit maybe is, is there a discretion on the part of the board? And I'm wondering if, if you know, if this is kept in there, does it need to be, you know, noted that to be clear, this position isn't shared by, by everybody on the board, but um, perhaps, you know, on the flip side, there's concern about whether or not the board is reviewing it uh, with objective criteria as opposed to sort of just based on or, or rank, you know, evaluating them just on subjective, you know, inputs um, that may not be, you know, uh, May not result in consistency. This is one of the things we talked about before, but does the board have criteria where they how do they determine that threshold of a given neighborhood that you're actually them, for instance, um, you know, to determine its an impact if, if the board uh, you know thinks that in a residential neighborhood this special permit can be granted as opposed to we've heard also on the spectrum the opinion that you know anything in a residential district sort of outside the point three might not be consistent with the district and therefore you know for instance one board member has said I think I may not be a position. You know, to, to support those special permits that brought, of course. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, if this is kept in there, you know, is it maybe worth noting uh, that if there's a special permit process having some objective criteria uh, or this concern about, you know, what uh, what the board is uh, based it solely on, you know, the board. So I guess what I would maybe would do is just that I would say as well suggest and tell me whether this feels better to I add another sentence at the end of this book saying other members support the as of right situation for owner occupied as to any residential districts. Because that I, I, I hear what you're saying, the way I've written it kind of emphasizes one position without saying there are there are different things on the board. Yeah. We can't we can't ignore board members. No, not at all. I just would say that that a little light to me that second version because I I would I don't if I'm the only one that's okay but I'm saying I'm opposed to those sentences completely because I have a feeling based on the experience that we've had that there's going to be a lot of not in my backyard for no no reason other than they just don't want it and that's not then it throws the whole ordinance away. So you don't. I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to do is say that you have mixed opinions. Do you feel strongly that we should say that? No, you, you may say that. I just wanted it to be more like opposed and, and for. As the sentence that you said just didn't feel as strong to me. Thank you for your that, I suppose. Uh, well, I would say you know, as a consequence, these members oppose allowing any SGR users in the right to the which would mean requiring a special permit for all the SGR use. Other members support the proposal, let's say the proposal to allow owner occupied SGR use uh, as a right to the resolution without a special, without a special, how you want to say it? Just. Is, Rick, is there an alternative to the last sentence? As a consequence, these members oppose allowing any SGR use as a right to the resolution. Isn't that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying. That neighborhood input uh, is required. I'm saying, or I'm saying, I'm concerned that without things like limitations on the number of units in a neighborhood, um, with, without um, 
What, what if I just struck the last sentence? I just say, some planning board members strongly believe in the formal process for those to and input from letters about the should be required for all of us to use residential neighborhoods just to do that. I would say, I would, I, that's fine, but I would add one thing to that sentence. And I would say in the absence of other limitations to the you know, number of units, et cetera, uh, input from letters and other neighbors should be required. Meaning, uh, this is a sort of a cat, you know, by neighborhood district or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that, and I, I don't know if that's really possible. Well, we have we've got a proposed that it's mentioned to us there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you could eliminate the last sentence. Okay. And, and figure it out. Figure it out. <laughs> That's for formal processes, yeah, especially. Yeah. Let me um, walk across that out. And that could that could be even in the, in the licensing process too. So. Okay, we move on. Treatment of existing STRUs. There are a number of investor-owned STRUs in the residential zoning districts, and also a number of STRUs both owner-occupied and investor-owned that do not comply with the Austin parking requirements proposed ordinance. Some planning board members would like to see an allowance in the ordinance for continued STRUs and investor-owned properties. Which could either be a time limit of amnesty provision, that is a sunset provision, or an amnesty tied to the current owner, not transferable to the future. Planning board members generally oppose continued STRUs, but off street parking is not provided for both owner occupied and investor units. Some planning board members do not agree with the concept of granting amnesty for any unit that does not comply with all provisions of the ordinance is ultimately enacted. But I've tried to say, you know, we've got mixed opinions here too. Some that accurate to me. <laughs> 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 That's all the opinions there. <laughs> so, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. Maybe just speaking to us. Uh, some planning board members would like to see an allowance in the ordinance for continued STRU use of investor owned properties in residential districts. In residential. Yep. Special permit financing criteria. Planning board recommends that the ordinance provide guidance to the zoning board of appeals with respect to required findings for granting special permit. Section da 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 requires a finding that the requested use will not, by its addition to a neighborhood, cause an excess of that particular use that could be detrimental to the character of said neighborhood. The ordinance should include a measurement or other guidance to assist the, the ZBA in making this site. Examples could include A, a limitation of one or two STRUs per block phase, B, a minimum separation of 300 feet between any two STRUs, or C, an absolute cap on the number of STRUs in the city. These could either be established as absolute standards in the ordinance or provided as presumptions for the ZBA to use. And finally, the granting a special permit for a particular property would or would not result in an excess of STRUs in the neighborhood. Next section requires the finding that the requested use is essential and or yeah. desirable to the public convenience or wealth. The ordinance should include a general statement regarding the public benefits of STRUs in residential and business districts to which the ZBA can refer to making this money. Another criterion to consider in granting an STRU special permit could include a history of operation without issues. So I think we talked about this whole range of things last time. Try to capture thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, just a question. Yeah. This is all informing a special permit process for the ZP. So back to what we were talking about a minute ago. If if something uh, is is not a special permit, and we're talking about how to how to look at the number of units. How 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 would that then be addressed? If if 
this is addressing the special permit process, which really is only how uh, does the rest of them get some kind of quantifiable? Uh, Turn it into a special permit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't think yeah, I, don't I, see see any, I don't see any way that you could, I suppose you could. You'd have to write it into the. You'd you have to write it in and say that whatever it is, that you, minimum separation is one thing you can do. Limit of, you, could, you could do that, and then whoever is the first one in right. is the one who. It's in. And as we know, we've heard a resident, I think it was on Middle Street, who was Middle Street, who said there were five or seven STRUs on his block. Yeah. So which we get rid of three get rid of three or five of them as soon as he really takes back you know, it's, it's tough. I don't I don't see a way around that other than that special. That you had come up with the idea of having a presumption. Is that what you were thinking of? And having just, I mean, I know I, I said either it's absolute standard or a presumption. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Well, um, I'm just trying to get to the end of this discussion because I know I'm going to go back to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the last item: licensing enforcement. Although the planning board's purview is limited to advising the council on zoning ordinance, the issue of enforcement and thus the licensing ordinance is inextricable from the zoning discussion. There was a concern that the city does not have the resources to respond effectively and expeditiously to ordinance and license violations or to neighbor complaints, particularly on weekends when problems may be more likely. Board members believe that a licensing ordinance with strong monitoring and enforcement provisions. Must be enacted before the zoning ordinance is amended to prevent STR use. I think that that's the system. Page one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we go back to one? Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Which page? Do. Which page? Okay. Okay. When I look at the way treatment of existing STR use is outlined below it, I see three bullet points that I think very fairly represent the opinions. Yeah, you want to do, you want to do bullet points like that? I would like to see a sentence that's, so you started it, some planning board members strongly believe in a formal process for notice input. I think that an equal sentence in that same paragraph would be, and some planning board members strongly believe neighborhood input is not a part of this ordinance. And that just, whether you say anything more, but it's, it's more about the property qualifying. That's fair. And so you basically say refer to the refer to the requirements. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. there's a bullet point that talks about input from the planners. If there's part of that bullet point, you could just say in the absence of other limitations or controls, specifically outline input from the planners and other neighbors should be. Can you say that? In the absence of other limitations or controls uh, that would be specifically outlined in the amendment, input from the budgets and other measures should be required for all. Okay. 
I have to think of other stuff that's in the back of the books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I don't think I do. Um, what is uh, planning and development? In? There, there's just lectures. No, you can listen. Yeah, if I could, I mean, I'll defer to you. Uh, obviously, I think for the benefit of the council, they probably would like to know your input as soon as possible. But at the same time, they're probably not likely to have that planning and development. Um, you know, picking this up again um, until they get done with budget, you know, which is the next couple of weeks at least. So I've been keeping the sponsor and the chair of planning development up to date. I don't believe mm -hmm. sharing the memos that I sent out to the board. So <laughs> that's fine. I'll just keep doing that. Sure, I, yeah, I'll defer to you. I, I um, just recognize, I mean, from my experience with the council, I also recognize that while some of those counselors are getting that you know, input and getting a little bit of heads up of where the plan board might be ending up with this. Um, Young members may not have the benefit until you have your final report, right? right. Um, but again, that's the difficulty here is uh, hopefully speaking. Uh, a lot, it seems like there are a lot of these questions that still be before the council because you know, there are things right. like there. And when we, and we said our final report, some of us think this and some of us think that. Right. So right. how much help is that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I, there are some things I think, really, like, if I was in the council, there are some things that are definitely helpful in here. There are other things where you know that's more difficult. Yeah. The, the things where there's less, you know, Consistency that's more difficult, but there are some things you point out here that are very useful to the council that are very clear cut. So, I mean, those would be less, you know. So, I'll, I'll take another step at it. I'm so happy with this. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until next year. <laughs> so, um, we'll continue the discussion on next week. If I get something out soon, anybody can do that. And I guess what I would suggest is again, you can't have a back and forth by email. So if you have um, comments, send them to Andy and, um, and be as specific as you can. And then Andy and I can meet and you know, go over everything that's come in and address it. And maybe come up with a question next week. Does that make sense? Can we do that? Do it that way? Um, I, I, I have no issue with the, the comments going to the item would necessarily be treat that as a you know a sort of serial deliberation or something like that right so i think it, as long as you're giving me your inputs i can convey generically i don't know if i can be able to sort of translate from that in different members position of course right but i, I think i could talk to you directly about what i'm hearing generically and then you can try as best as possible here i think hopefully, <laughs> hopefully wrap up a report in the next meeting that you know sufficient to represent the board enough that they send that to the city council yeah. and um position of the chair Chairman of the board is open for next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just on that comment, I mean, I think, I think it's good as Andy said, I think pointed out some things, and I think they need to deliberate on it. I think it's good for them to yeah. see the two sides. Yeah. So, okay, I don't, I don't think it made me feel better. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> harmful. Um, moving on to approval of the minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve, and um, Richard was absent for the April May 19th. One. May I have to abstain from May 17th. I think you're also absent from April 19th, too. I was, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. So you, you're absent from both of them. I think we need to do them separately because there's different because Heather was absent for the 17th. So let's, um, I've sent comments uh to Caitlin, um, and we have, I don't know, did you send any comments? Right now? Uh, April, April 19th, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At this point, we're so far away, probably nobody remembers what we're doing. I would accept a motion to approve the meetings of uh, April 19th. As amended. As amended. Yeah. So, so moved. <laughs> Second, anybody? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Except for Richard? Okay. <laughs> there. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the uh, meeting of the minutes of May 17th. Yeah, I need some comments on that. No, I would be fine with <laughs> Just me? Okay. Uh, okay, so everybody except for Heather and Richard, um, I need a motion to approve. Motion to approve those minutes. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay, you're approved. And I need a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? <laughs> we are adjourned. Boy, move to items on the agenda.